Uh, after Libra, we have Scorpio. Everyone knows Scorpio. <laughs> Everyone knows a Scorpio. All my best friends are Scorpios. <laughs> They're all crazy. Um, and I, I actually have, I have, I have four planets in Scorpio. Um, I have Mercury, I have Venus, uh, I have Mars, <laughs> and I have Uranus, which is actually exalted in um, Scorpio, which might explain this stuff. Um, but uh, so was anyone else born between 74 and 83 or whatever it was. Uh, anyway, moving on. So Scorpio says, I control. And that, so Scorpio's house is more about your the your potential relationships, your possible relationships. Uh, the you know the uh, as opposed to who you serve or who you're balanced with, it's who you might know or who might work for you or who you might control. You know that kind of thing. Um, Scorpio is also tends to be uh, all about creative energy uh, as well. Um, Scorpio respond, uh, also ties to Yasad, which ties re reproductive organ in the body, right? Your creative aspects. Um, okay, so that's, that's Scorpio. All right, so uh, and Scorpio, again, is fixed water. Libra was uh, cardinal air. Uh, Virgo was uh, mutable earth. I don't think I said that. Uh, and now we are at Sagittarius. And Sagittarius says, I block. And as you could probably guess, Sagittarius's house is about your philosophies and your beliefs and, and uh, the, uh, that which you take in that shapes your, that, that informs your life enough to matter, to mean something. Like you would make a, base a decision off that. That's, that's a philosophy. And because he's mutable fire, if you can imagine like the, the centaur firing his bow, choosing his targets, putting his philosophy, you know, out there where it, in, a, in a mutable way, as opposed to being impulsive, the I start, but I kind of don't finish, or the I burn slow and steady. This is the I go where I need to kind of the mutable aspects. Right. Yeah. The mutable aspects. So. Uh, after that, we will move back to, uh, this will be, uh, Cardinal Earth, and that is Capricorn. Capricorn says, I master. Now, what's also worth going into is technically the planets rule signs as well. So for instance, since we were talking about it so much, Saturn rules Capricorn. Okay, it's like Capricorn is the Saturnal house in that sense. Um, he is like, all right, so like the, the goat, the mountain goat, he is constantly trying to get to the top of the mountain, right? That's his, that's his nature, right? The, he is the master of earth, the, as opposed to, um, you know, just having or like Virgo, for instance, like my wife's a Virgo. So like the way I always sort of describe it is like Virgos are like pruners. Like if you imagine like a bonsai tree, if you had a bonsai tree, you'd want a Virgo working on it because they're like meticulous and careful and every single thing is like deliberate, except all your strengths are also your weaknesses, right? Everywhere that you're strong is also where you're weak. So while Aries is impetuous and gets stuff started, he tends not to finish. Right. Virgo kind of doesn't know when to stop pruning. That's like her weakness. She doesn't know when to stop being mutable. Right. Because that's her nature to be mutable. So like, you know, if you don't know when to stop, you might ruin it. Right. In the same sense, Capricorn is like the master of Earth. This would be your CEO of a major corporation would be very Capricorn. Presidents and leaders and that kind of stuff are masters of Earth, you know generally speaking or whatever it's sort of like in the same way that the saturn also kind of rules earth in the sense that everything is bound and nothing is more solid and bound than matter you know in that sense so that's that's capricorn right so yeah you can see why well, some people gotta give him a bad rap or whatever but that's just his nature man that's what he does climbs the mountain 
right? You climb the mountain. We climb the mountain. Everybody's trying. Everybody's looking for paradise, whatever that is, right? Everybody's trying to get there, and you know, we're it's kind of in theory what we're searching for, and these are the tools to use. Find your, make your own paradise. Make heaven here now. Why would you deserve it in the afterlife? You couldn't make it here, you know, or what? So, anyway, we're almost done. Um, all right, so moving on, we're back to the air signs. And Aquarius, everyone loves Aquarius. Uh, and Aquarius says, I. So while Capricorn sort of oversees your place in life, your role, your like, almost like why you're here. Like when the, when the robot becomes self-aware and goes, what is my purpose? It's like, well, that's your purpose. What's your purpose, right? To, so while your career perhaps may be Cap Capricorn, Aquarius has more, more to do with you, like your hopes and your objectives, right? Your master plans, your great, huge dreams. Aquarius dreams big, you know, he's, that's kind of his thing, right? Uh, he's independent. He doesn't give a crap what anybody else thinks. You know, he's going to go his own way, man. And, you know, that's Aquarius, right? Um, okay. And then we're, and then we're at the final, which uh, is Pisces. Um, so, sorry, fixed air, mutable water, and we're, we're done. Uh, so, Pisces. Pisces is water, right? Pisces is water. Oh, that's interesting. Everybody's like, why isn't Aquarius water? Why is Aquarius an air sign, being Aquarius? But think about it this way. He's the water bearer. He's not the water, he's the jar, right? He's the air that holds the water in form. Make sense? Okay, cool. So Pisces says, I believe. So you can see, for instance, where you start getting a lot of, like, if you, you know, it wouldn't probably be a huge surprise to see where some of these signs would be exalted in others, for instance. Like, um, uh, okay, so, all right, I'll let you know a little secret, something I figured out. Um, okay, so I uh, we were kind of talking about Joseph Campbell before, right? Um, I am obsessed with his work on the hero's journey, right? The hero of a thousand faces. Uh, I am obsessed with that as a structure. I'm trying to create a whole game around it. I have like this whole idea, right? But what I noticed when I was looking at his work and I was studying this stuff at the same time, I happened to notice that the hero's journey follows the zodiac. For instance, the call to the adventure, hesitate on the threshold, supernatural aid, crossing the first threshold into the realm of the unknown, the zone of magnified power, the road of trials, unity with the goddess for Venus rules uh, Libra, um, confrontation with the father figure, uh, supernatural boon. You got, you got the who's he, what's it that you went on the quest for. Hesitating, uh, or, uh, hesitating on the return or basking in the realm of uh, worldly delights. Magical flight and crossing the return threshold changed. It's all right there. So... Um, Is he acknowledged that in his book? I, I feel like I figured this out, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I've seen, I've seen, other, well, okay, to be fair, he named like 17 or like something like uh, 13 to 17 phases. So I had to cut some. But so like, for instance, one of his big one is the belly of the whale, like Pinocchio or Jonah or whatever, where the hero is consumed by the unknown and he, to the, the normal world, he may as well be dead. Right. But I'm like, that's implied by crossing the threshold. You don't need the belly of the whale because you already did that when you, you moved. Because cancer moves sideways like the crab, right? It comes at, or like the chariot. Cancer rules the chariot card, the chariot coming at things sideways, right? She's not a, as opposed to Ares, who's like direct, right? Cancer will come at from the side, right? That's the idea. So, um, so you're saying that Campbell is exalted. Because well, okay. Oh, right. That's why I was, why I put that up. All right. So for instance, one of the other things that I kind of 
noticed and got kind of turned on to was the idea that all our great myths and stories and legends are essentially ex exemplifications of certain planetary and zodiacal combinations. So for instance, the sun is exalted in Aries. As opposed to like Mars rules Aries, but the sun is exalted in Aries. And that is every action adventure, kick in the door, uh, beat up the bad guys right? <laughs> story we've ever heard. Another one is when, another exaltation is when Saturn is in Libra. And that represents like marriage, like marriage unto death, right? To Like, like lo eternal love. Right, and that's your Romeo and Juliet story, right there. Love unto death. There's and there's more. There's way more, but like so. For instance, there that also kind of explains a lot of our god forms from myth and legend and stuff. You can for like we we're gonna get into that, but like there's like so for instance, you can put like all the Greek gods on the tree of life. You can put the Norse gods on the tree of life. You can put the Egyptian gods on the tree of life. They all have these planetary correspondences. So, like, just real quick, Thor, Tyr, Balder, Freya, Odin, the Norns. There's the Norse pantheon right there. You know, uh, you can do uh, Zeus, Ares, or Athena, uh, Apollo, Dim or, uh, uh, Aphrodite, duh, Venus, uh, uh, Hermes, and then you've got uh, Diana. Or whoever, right? Okay, wait a minute. I would, let me see if I get this straight. This is, um, you know, this is Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. This is Jewish mysticism. And you're using something that's outside of Judaism? Not really. To assign mythology and all that? Well, let, let's put it to you. Let, let's now, think about it another way. Now, I know what you're now, saying. I, yeah, that adds, uh, now, that becomes a problem now because we don't have... It's okay to put Keter and all that, what you're saying. But now you're assigning something that's completely outside of Judaism. You know, well, first of all, you know, my friend... These planets are in Kabbalah. Well, this stuff is in there. So well, we have planets, but well, the, these these correspondences, I I didn't make this stuff up. These correspondences are in Kabbalah, and the my point is the reason that you do that, the reason that I do that, I love comparative religion because I think that the second we get caught up in a single dogma, missing the point, missing the point, totally. Right? We can only we can only know what's we can only know what's true to ourselves. We come together and we try to we try to revolve around different concepts, right? That we, whether it's uh, you know the What are you saying, Mark? Is all of this wait a minute, hold on. Everything overlaps. There is no for I mean, I understand your faith, but what we're saying here, all these different mythologies, they do overlap. They if, if anything, I think it makes a more uh, uh, powerful, uh, 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 I don't know, accolade for the Kabbalists that they came up with this in the first place, right? Because they, they all right, I probably should have said this before, but the map is not the territory. This is a sigil that we use. It's a symbol. It's not the map. In the same way that you can pull out a map and you can see roads, but they don't look like the roads you drive down. They're they're approximations of them. It's a symbol, right? Because the symbol, symbols and images, those are the language of the unconscious. Well, the, well, the conscious mind uses language. We use language to confer information, to manipulate each other. We talk through form. But the, uh, the emotional stuff, that's, that's on the, on the force side. That's the unconscious. That's symbols and uh, dreams, visions, all that kind of stuff. The, so, like... I just want to say that you're not have no intentions of disrespect. But if, no, no, absolutely. Like here's, the, I I have a great deal of respect for like the Torah and the Bible and any 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 religious book that was more or less the received in, in one form or another. And I don't want to get hung up on whether it's the literal word of God or that we have to believe every word that's in there. I think once we start thinking that way, we're only gonna supernally limit ourselves right we can only well, you, can you know it's like, it's it's it i mean it's it's to the point where like i there isn't one faith there there couldn't be it, if we had one mandala 
that would answer all of life's questions. And everybody could look at it, and they would see it and know it, and that would be it. We'd be done. We'd be done with this whole experiment, right? Because everything is subjective. And while I like to present this in a sort of, hey, this is sort of universal, it's only universal to me, guys. You know, it works for me. And I've had success, like, su success enough that I feel confident that I can stand behind here and kind of talk about this stuff, right? Uh, so, like, it doesn't diminish, if anything, I think it empowers that stuff. Because there are always different ways to, re to, re to read, receive text, right? There, you could read it literally. Right, you could like, like let's let's take the Noah's Ark example, right? We could read it as a literal story. There's a dude built a boat, put two of every animal on it. The world flooded. He ended up on a mountain, right? The waters receded. He was spared. The end, right? But we can look at it a different way. We can find a metaphorical story in that. In that, while yes, there may have very well been an actual deluge sometime in our and. That doesn't matter because we can still take the story of Noah's Ark and we can see the story of evolution in it. We can see the story of uh, natural selection or uh, following your divine will or ending up on the top of the mountain. Like there's a metaphorical story in there too. Now there's even perhaps a more esoteric way to view it beyond that where we could kind of start looking at the tree of life. Remember when I did the story of Genesis? And I'm like, it's here. Do you see how it's here? Right? If I said Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you'd see that here. Right? Doesn't mean it's true or it doesn't diminish anything else. It's just a system that we can use if we want. Right? Or you can say bullshit. No, Rob, that don't, that, don't, that don't work for me. And if it doesn't work for you, then that's true. You can't work with it. I wish you could, but you can't. So, like, what am I going to say? Right? You know? So, like... Sorry, now I feel like I'm, I'm defending a little too much. I, I hope that you and I are on the same page. I really do think that not only, not only were they on to something, they got a bunch of stuff really right. Really right. And, and there, is, there, is a, there is a mystery to um, the Hebrew language, the way that the words are depicted. There, there's something fourth dimensional going on with it. I can't tell you what it is. I don't know. But I know it's, there's something, there's more to it than just letters, more to it than just letters. Um, and that's why we'll actually tend to use Hebrew when we're doing our magic work, when we're doing intonations and stuff. But I think that is actually about where I wanna end. We'll pick up, uh, where, we'll pick up below the abyss. How about that? That'll work. We'll pick up here in Jupiter. All right, great. Can I make Thanks. a suggestion? Yep. Can you take that page home and put it on the handout for us? Uh, <laughs> sure. I can uh, I can probably give you something even better than this, because okay. uh, I have uh, other notes. Is I could, for instance, I could go through like which which planets rule and are exalted and which signs. That's useful information to have. Um, yeah, but this mm. this is what you covered today, so that would be handy when you come back next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come back and refer to that. Cool. Okay, so I guess what we'll do then is we'll pick up magic one of two. Uh, in February 29th? 26. 26th. Okay. And then I'll do a magical 201, the magical accoutrement class, sometime after. Right. We okay. Set up the more yep. Stuff. Not a problem. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all.